we're coming here to a series uh, that we're continuing on with. It's about Jesus, and we're walking with Jesus. We're just following along the road, looking at the stories, looking at the teachings, looking at the great miracles that Jesus has done. Uh, we come here to a passage that's about Jesus and the Canaanite woman. Some of you might be thinking to yourself, well, what's a, a Canaanite woman? Well, when the Israelites were led by Moses out of Egypt into the desert, uh, they wandered there in the desert for some 40 years. Uh, before they went into the land that was promised to them, the promised land, or the land of milk and honey, or the land of Canaan, uh, it was occupied by non-Jews. It was occupied by the Gentiles or the outsiders. They were non-believers. They were pagans. They didn't believe in God. And that's what Matthew tells us about this woman, that she was a Canaanite woman. Um, she also had a big problem. She had a very big problem. Uh, and there seems to be an answer. And that answer is Jesus. The problem is, is that she's an outsider. Have you ever traveled and everyone knows that you are an outsider? Everyone knows that you are a tourist or a person that's not from there. Uh, for me, I go places and my New York accent is a dead giveaway. Uh, I might think I don't have much of an accent, but when I go other places, they know and they can tell. Uh, and if my accent doesn't give it away, uh, perhaps my family might. Like when my kids were little, I can remember one time we were driving down to Florida and our van broke down in Petersburg, Virginia. And we were there stuck for a weekend. We got a nice little journey and, and trip out of it. But that night we went to a restaurant. It was a barbecue restaurant, a very Southern barbecue restaurant. And as we're eating our dinner, up next to us there is a big, huge painting of a Civil War battle there in Petersburg, a very famous battle. And my son, Zach, who is four years old, goes walking up and he looks at the painting and he points at the Union Army who are on one side in their blue uniforms, uh, the North, and there on the opposite side are the, the Confederate Army in their grays. And Zach points to the, to the Union Army there in their blues and he says, those are the good guys. And then he points to the Southern and says, and those are the bad guys. I don't know where he got that from, but we were lucky to make it out of there that day. Well, they knew that day that we were not Southerners. Uh, as we come here to this passage, we see that Jesus is talking to this woman, this outsider. Um, he's giving her uh, some, uh, some help as we come and see here. So starting from verse 21, this is God's word. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. That's a ways north here. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Well, we're gonna look at really four impressive things that Jesus found in this woman. Some traits that I think that we can develop as well. So the first thing I want you to see that Jesus was impressed with her knowledge. Remember that this Canaanite woman, she was a Gentile. She was a non-Jew. Uh, most Gentiles didn't know much of anything about the Old Testament scriptures, the scriptures of that time. Uh, but she knew the messianic title of the Messiah who was to come, the son of David, a descendant of David, the great king. So how did she know this? 
she had checked it out beforehand. I don't know exactly how she did that, but there was no Google, there was no internet, there was no public library that she could go to, uh, but she just would go around maybe and ask other people about this. And she had heard stories and asked even further and found out more about Jesus. Before she went to Jesus, she had a context. She had some background. I'm sure that there were stories that spread about Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000 we had just talked about, uh, talking about maybe Jesus walking on the water to his disciples, if that was shared, or the healing of so many different people at Gennesaret. But stories of experience were not enough. She needed to know how these, these experiences, these miracles, these healings were possible. She needed to have some content. And Jesus was a person who could do these things. And she has to be asking, how can he do these things? The answer was wrapped up in his name. It was wrapped up in the title that she called him by, the son of David. People love stories. Uh, stories are what grab people. When I worked for this ministry, Youth for Christ, Campus Life, one of the things that we would teach kids was a method of evangelism. They called it three-story evangelism. You would take your story, and then you would also talk to them about their story, and then you would present to them God's story. But evangelism is not just about experience. It's about propositional truth. It's the reality which verbalizes the experience. In Hosea 4, 6, God says to the priest, because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you. Knowledge is so important. It's like the little boy who was scared one night during a thunderstorm. And his parents said, don't worry. Don't be afraid at all because God's watching over you. And then the little boy thinks about it for a second. And he says, yeah, but I think I'd rather have somebody with skin watching over me. And so he understood that we've got to put skin on that experience, the propositional truth. We've got to know more about God and what it really means that he can watch over us, that he can take care of us, that he can deliver as Jesus was right here. I think that Jesus was impressed by this Canaanite woman so much uh, that she came and brought this title for him, Lord, you are the son of David, because she had checked it out. So he was impressed with her knowledge. He was also impressed with her humility. In verse 27, she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now that might sound strange to some of you, it might sound kind of insulting here. Um, there is a word there for what they would call dogs, and it's not a good term, and it would mean like the Gentile dogs. The Jews might say like the non-believers, like some might call them like the infidels, the people that weren't in their group there. Uh, later, they would call the Christians by this. They would call them the Christian dogs. Uh, but that's not the word that's used here. It's referring to little dogs. The ones that would be down, and big dogs weren't kept as like pets or anything, but they might have little dogs that could fit under your table there. Uh, and what Jesus could be, what Jesus said here could be taken as an insult unless they really understood the word here. Either way, whether she understood it or not, um, she might have taken it as an insult to her heritage, to herself, that Jesus would not come and, and take care of her. And she could say, I'm not going to take any help from you now because you said something insulting. But she accepted it, and then she asked him again for his help. Now, notice that Jesus didn't build her up with any like kind of flowery compliments here. He didn't say something like, you know, oh, you're so wonderful and you deserve me to come and help. Um, she came with this humility, with this true humility. Jesus' ministry, he meant here, was first to the Jews. And in fact, it was to the Jews. Paul's ministry was first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. But she was there uh, and she realized that Jesus was there for the Jews, but she hoped to just be able to gather just some of the crumbs that were dropped down below the table there. We've got a couple of dogs, uh, little uh, mini golden doodles, and they're allowed to sit under the table uh, at our feet during dinner there, but we're not allowed to feed them at all. And uh, they like when a little food drops down there. 
but we used to have a Rhodesian Ridgeback, big dog. And because she was too big to fit under the table, we weren't, still weren't allowed to feed her, but you wouldn't let her get anywhere close. We made her stay out in the other room there because she could easily just come up and just put her face right over and scarf the kid's food right off the table there. Well, this woman understood she was like the little dog waiting just for some crumbs below. Uh, Jesus, uh, I would suggest that Jesus heard her because of her humility. The world today tells us that we're winners, uh, that we are uh, deserving of something special, uh, that we can make it on our own. But the Bible tells us that that's not true. It tells us that we're lost. It tells us that we've failed what we were called to do. We failed to meet our purpose, and that's to glorify God. That's to worship God. And that might seem like a downer to some of you, but when we go to Jesus with humility, I think Jesus is impressed with that. So Jesus was impressed with her knowledge and her humility. He was also impressed with her faith. I think this might be the most important part here. In verse 22b, she comes and she says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering, t t suffering terribly from demon possession. See, she had called him Lord and the son of David here. And she appealed to him on the basis of his mercy and on the basis of his mercy alone. This is how people need to come to Jesus. This is how you need to come to Jesus on the basis of his mercy, asking for mercy, not demanding anything, not thinking that you have rights, that this is what I deserve, but just coming to him on the basis of that mercy, putting aside any self-righteousness, recognizing that you don't deserve his mercy, that you say, there is nothing within me that makes me deserve this. Understanding what the Apostle Paul said, that was at the top of our bullets in there, from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, so that no one can boast. Well, we see here in verses 27, uh, I'm sorry, it's verse 25, it says, The woman came and knelt before him. So besides coming on the basis of his mercy, she comes and she either just is putting herself down in a place of submission there, or she's worshiping him. She could be kneeling there, then she says, Lord, help me. It seems like an act of worship here. In verses 27 to the beginning of 28, she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Not just that you have faith, you have great faith. This is the one time in the scriptures that Jesus says, you have great faith to someone. Against all odds, against all opposition, against fear of rejection, this woman went to Jesus and she believed. She was an outsider, but she still came to Jesus and she believed. She put her trust, her faith in him. And Jesus, in response, answers her request. She went to Jesus, appealed to him on the basis of his mercy and his grace, and he answered her. Well, we come here and we see that we are given this gift of faith. And that's the most important thing that we can understand there about faith, that it's a gift. That it's not something we gin up in ourselves. It's not something we work up. It's given to us as a gift. And then secondly, we've got to understand that we have to want it. We've got to receive it. A gift is worth nothing unless you've received it and you've opened it up. Then we've got to not just receive it, but we've got to exercise that. We've got to go through our lives working it like a muscle. Maybe you've ever heard people say to you, I wish I had faith like you, or I wish I had faith like someone else. Some people admire faith. Um, faith changes people. But some people don't admire it all so much. They might even laugh at you when they look at your faith. They might say things like, oh, it's not very sophisticated to have faith. It's just a, a blind leap of faith. It's not rational, it's silly. People have all kinds of uh, these bad views about faith. But we have to, to look here, remember that it's a gift. 
and we've got to want it and we've got to exercise it. If you understand that it's a gift and you want it, you get it. God says he's already come in. The only reason you even want it is because he's come in and he's changed your heart. He's worked on your heart and changed it from death to life. So receive it. Uh, the Can Canaanite woman had seen Jesus and came and worshiped God and had this faith. And Jesus gave it to her. Jesus had given it to her even so that the, the opportunity for her to come and to put her faith in him and to, to worship him. So Jesus was impressed with her, her knowledge, her humility, and her faith. Lastly, as we close up, Jesus was impressed by her, her perseverance and her persistence. Jesus uh, comes to this woman there to listen to her, to help her out, but only after she kept coming to Jesus over and over and over. In fact, it says that the, the disciples were even encouraged or encouraged Jesus to send her away. She keeps crying out to us. She keeps crying out to you. Just send her away here. You know, Martin Luther said, if I, know, if I knew that the world would come to pieces tomorrow, I would still plant my apple tree and pay all my bills. What he was saying was that he was going to keep going no matter what. That he was going to, to persevere. That he wasn't going to quit. Uh, you might have heard Winston Churchill. You know, he said, never, never give up. I can still remember when I was a kid seeing the t-shirts and the bumper stickers on the, the back of the trucks as we drive down somewhere on vacation. And we would go like this to the truckers to get them to blow their air horn. And you'd see the keep on trucking sign on the back of their thing where people would wear it in their shirts. Keep on trucking. Just means keep on going. Persevere. Don't give up. Um, we can need to persist in all these things. Someone said there's, there's faith and then there's persevering faith. I would suggest that persevering faith is the only real kind of faith. If you've got faith in God, true faith in God, it will persevere. And it won't persevere just because you will work at it. It will persevere because God's the one that will give you the power to persevere. I love John Gerstner's quote from, he's R.C. Sproul's mentor, and he said when he calls it the, the perseverance of the saints, the perseverance of believers like us, he says the perseverance of the saints or believers would better be called the perseverance of saints or believers with and for God. Uh, we do it with God and we do it for God. Uh, some of you might uh, know like 12 step programs. Maybe you've been part of something like that. My father-in-law was part, before he passed away, was part of Alcoholics Anonymous, AA. And he would share all these little kind of uh, these sayings or slogans. One like, you know, like one day at a time. That's probably one of their most famous ones there. Or when you're talking about like non-alcoholic beer, drinking it when they say, don't drink a drop. And, and he would say, you know, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck, meaning no alcohol, alcohol, beer, stay away from it, no matter what. Uh, some of you might see sayings or slogans up on the gym that are there or in your classrooms that are up there to try to inspire you to, to achieve and to do your best. I do this workout called uh, P90X, and uh, Tony Horton, who, who leads it there, he has all these little kind of sayings there, and one of the things he says is, Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither was your body. Or uh, do your best and forget the rest. I think that's great. That's what that pertains to Christianity, to our faith. Do your best and forget the rest. Faith is what you continue to have when the slogans, when the sayings no longer work. And God's the one that gives us that kind of faith. When you've been beaten up and you still believe, that's real faith. That's persistent faith. That's persevering. When you've prayed and prayed and prayed and you don't seem to have an answer, that's real faith. That's persevering faith. And I think Jesus is impressed with that. Maybe your situation seems tough. It seems difficult. It seems dark. There's no answers. Uh, maybe others think that you're crazy to have faith, to keep 
going to God, to keep asking him to help you. Well, don't give up. Keep taking it to him. Keep it up because it's the gift of faith that he's given you. And we exercise that faith when we keep persevering and keep bringing these things to him. And I think Jesus is impressed with that, even though he's the one that gives us the strength to keep going on. So just like it did for the Canaanite woman, the reality of answered prayer will eventually come. I don't know the answer that God has. It might not be the answer you're looking for, but he will have an answer for you. And he will see you through whatever difficulty, whatever trouble that is. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would give us the knowledge and the humility to come to you with anything, in anything, no matter how dark, no matter how difficult. Give us the faith to trust in you and to trust in your grace and your mercy and your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.